Hey guys, welcome back. It is Teasdale here, and today we are back because spoiler season is officially ended, and we have the whole regalia of commons, which is great. I love new commons all the time, every time, even if they're broken, I don't really care. So, what I would like to say is, first of all, please do not forget to check out Casting Commons right above my head. I'll duck a little bit. And we are a podcast that obviously talks about Pauper every single week. We'll be covering some of these spoilers as well for those that don't listen to this but listen to the podcast. But then they also wouldn't know that I'm saying this. Uh, also, please don't forget to check out Cards Realms where I'll be doing a deep dive into each common that like I think is playable and explain why and things like that. So check that out. I'll do a set review too. So that'll be great to see. Um, and yeah, obviously, don't forget to like and subscribe. We are obviously here. Still churning out the content. Sorry, it has been a bit slow lately. I've been trying to find different types of content. And I'm also a bit busy with baby life. So, anyways, without further ado, enough of my life story. And let's dive right in. So, I want to mention two honourable mentions. Um, I guess... The first one, I believe, is Skullcap Snail. I want to mention this, and I don't want to mention this on playability. This is one thing that I definitely don't want to mention this on, is because we have had a lot of these effects, and a lot of these effects are not uh, really playable. But one thing that I've noticed is basically this is like one of the better ones. So it it's basically a burglar rat which is the exact same stat, but it's a rat. But what it does is it exiles a card as opposed to making the opponent discard a card, and that's that's pretty big. So I don't know why Burglar Rat's getting power crept out of the format, and I don't think the exile will probably change anything unless you're really going to add it to like some Chitter Lock deck or something. No idea there, but it is definitely... It's interesting to see that they are power creeping certain cards out of the format, which is weird, but, you know. Honourable mention. Nice to see that they're uh, changing things up, but Exile is definitely a lot better than, uh, obviously, Discard and all the other... We've had about five different variations of this card in, like, the past ten sets or something. But I'm sure we had one in, like, Neon Dynasty as well and things like that, so... Definitely cool to see them keep printing them, I guess. But at this point, you're going to obviously power creep it out to kind of get there. Anyways, my actual honourable mention, which is Nurturing Bristleback. So this card, I don't think it's obviously, it's not going to go into like Ponser. It's not going to go into Ramp or anything like that. But where I do think this card might shine is in like a Reanimator Shell. And the reason why I think this is... You think of obviously a lot of the, the reanimation cards that we have. We've got like Troll, some of them run like Oliphant and the uh, Ent. The big thing about Reanimator now to me is the removal is that good that basically you kind of. You reanimate your guy, they have the removal spell, you're back to square one. Um, where this is different because at least it leaves something behind, which I don't think we've ever really had in Pauper as a reanimated and threat. It's a big body, a 5-5 five is nothing to, like, joke about. But it leaves a 3-3 three, three dinosaur, which ultimately allows, um, allows, obviously, to still at least have some form of game plan, even if it does to die. And I don't think this is obviously going to be game-breaking for reanimator, but I just think it's another toy that they have access to, which... Is kind of different, if that makes sense. So, obviously, if your opponent's prepared for Ent and you play your Troll and they can't snuff out the Ent, that's obviously great. If you're against Aggro and they can't deal with the 5 7 because it's three bolts or something and they've only got two, obviously great. But if they've only got like a cast down, as their removal kind of thing. And it's all about what you feel they're going to play. And what they're most likely going to do, be able to deal with. If they only have the one removal spell. Obviously this is where Bristlebrack could come in. To be be another threat. That kind of at least leaves something behind. And yeah. I think it's definitely worth considering. 
Um, the same is also true for the ward guy, but again, it kind of it's similar similar sort of vein that they can't deal with removal is the blue guy, the island cycler. But the reason that I, I chose this one is most reanimated decks at the moment are like red, bl uh, green, black, maybe splash and red for like Oliphant or something. But generally, yeah, they're like green, black because they, they want the Nth and they want the uh, troll. But yeah, that's what that's why I think this card might see some play. Again, it's reanimator. It's not going to break any, you know, it's not becoming tier one or anything like that. But definitely interesting. Anyways, without further ado, moving on to my top five. Um, my top five might be a bit different. Uh, but a lot of people obviously think that a lot of these cards are fairly powerful. So it might be fairly obvious. But in at number five anyways is maybe a surprise one too, is Tinker's Tote. I uh, I think this card is surprisingly okay and may see some play. Um, where I see it shining, to be fair, is in like a Boros deck. So with your Glint Orcs and your Core Skyfishers, you can bounce this artifact and then make two more artifacts. So for three money, you get three artifacts. Which is, it's pretty good. It bridges the gap between 4 and 7 for Frogmites and Murren Forces. And it really helps you catch up if you are playing things like Glintork and Core Skyfisher, which aren't artifacts. So they kind of, you were always, you always had that issue of being low. So you would struggle to get Murren Forces, struggle to get Frogmites out, struggle for Thought Cast sometimes. So, this card really helps you allow to bridge that gap to a lot further. So, with that that being said, that's kind of the idea behind why I think it's fine. And um, the unplayability, like as in the thing it does when it's sitting there, the gain three life, it's not great, don't get me wrong. And it, it literally is three mana for a dead artifact almost and two one ones, which is again you're not breaking any games with with how wide that's going to, i don't know if it'll replace batterfist batterfist goes really aggressive and obviously equips onto other creatures in the late game to make those more aggressive i.e your glint hawks or your core skyfishers so it really like allows you to you know get a lot of damage in a lot earlier which is really good against combo decks which boros kind of struggles with where this really helps you just commit your game plan so It'd be interesting to see if this does end up replacing something like Boros Batterfist and then maybe even make like a red white glitters version because this allows you to again catch up on artifacts where if you would you would lose out on if you're running Glint Hawk and Core Skyfisher. So I think it's definitely worth testing and is the reason why I've put it at number five because I do think it could surprise some people. I don't think it will see playing blue white glitters. Um it is other threats that they can obviously put on the glitters on it's also other one ones that they go wide with things like that but ultimately three man is a lot to ask for that deck so i don't think it will make the cut but is another consideration which is why i think something like red white synth or glitters or something like that might utilize something like this anyways at number four that is probably the only pick that probably might be a bit out there to be fair at number four we have mephitic draft so what this basically is is Ica Wellspring five to eight. So if any, I think if any gardens or black based decks were considering Lembas, I just don't think they do anymore. Um, this just basically is better to me in every way. Like don't get me wrong, you lose a life, fair enough, but you still get to have that ancestral recall at home kind of thing with Deadly Dispute. Um, which is obviously great. It's, yeah, I don't think there's much really to say about this, but basically if you are a black based deck, so Gardens, potentially even Affinity if you needed to run more uh, Ico Wellsprings, you can basically run these without running Lembas or no need to run Lembas. Um, yeah, like you literally have access to five to eight Wellsprings, which is obviously we all know how powerful Ico Wellspring is. And why not? run more <laughs> so i really i really do think this card's probably going to see a lot of play in a lot of black decks 
obviously there's no real reason to actually actually play this other wellspring unless you're really going down going heavy and going black back to mono black devotion um it might be an excuse for uh mono black devotion decks to now run Ica wellspring deadly dispute package but that's basically gardens at this point um yeah seems solid uh really hyped for this card and i think that basically this card will see a lot more play than a lot of people think solid uh moving on to number three is goblin tome raider so they basically went looked at mono red in papa that's a joke actually they're, they're never going to look at anything in papa they just print comments for draft but they basically looked at goblin guide and went you know what we need to do we need to power creep this so let's print this at common because this is basically goblin guide with a little bit of an extra strep but you know the fact that you can basically go Great Furnace, Goblin Tome Raider, I now have a, effectively a Goblin Guide without a downside is pretty good. Um, yeah, 2-2 two -two with haste, strong. It's a Gitter Lava Runner that doesn't need a lot of jumping through hoops. You are playing a lot of artifacts anyways. So yeah, card is strong. And you can also lead on like Swift Spear and then follow it up with like Implement or epicure and then this and that's without running finding your great furnace like you do run a lot of artifacts anyways naturally so yeah pretty solid this card probably should be higher up but this i guess shows my this is my bias towards aggro decks and mid-range decks i guess i prefer playing mid-range decks and this card's probably the best card in the set probably but between three and one is fairly close so you 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 can easily interchange these like they are very very close they're all very very powerful in my eyes um so yeah this card is definitely strong and one of the best commons in this set by far no questions asked anyways moving on to number two card is very very strong moving on to number two we have fanatical offering so we have a lot of Deadly Dispute effects. We have Reckoner's Bargain. We have Deadly Dispute. We have Costly Plunder. And then I believe there's another one. But the thing that I do like about this one. So a map token generally isn't very good. It activates its sorcery. It explores. So it does have some utility. If you have creatures, you can always make your guy bigger. You can reset your persist. Don't forget that one. If you're playing a Goblin Combo, that is. Random things like that. But mainly, what this does is you sacrifice an artifact or a creature, you draw two cards, and create a lump of artifact to sacrifice later on. So, as weird as and niche as that seems, what what that means for decks like Gardens, for example, or uh, like black-white decks with obviously Deadly Dispute and Bargaining and things like that, or even Grixis Affinity, is... They allow you to basically sacrifice an artifact with a deadly dispute, make a treasure, you can fanatical offer in it the treasure to then make a map and then sacrifice the map to basically do something else if you have another offering or another deadly dispute. So the deadly disputes effectively can chain into each other. So what what generally happened most of the times anyways was if you had three of your eight deadly dispute effects um and you had a plant token for example you deadly dispute one and then you deadly dispute again the tre the map the treasure token and then you'd reckon as bargain the treasure token and then you now have nothing to sacrifice so you've kind of ended the chain with bargain where because this makes a lump of artifact to sacrifice you can carry on that chain so all eight copies if you want eight maybe even seven all chain into each other which sounds Probably not that great, but that that is incredible. That basically means you can like shave on artifacts. You can you don't have to potentially run your seven or eight artifact things to sacrifice. You don't have to run, um, you know, random things because they chain in. They can just sit there on the side, and it's this is going to be there for my deadly dispute. Like you could even you could get greedy with that, um, and it basically opens up other options. Even though the map token itself isn't actually that good. It's not a treasure. 
It is nowhere close to a treasure. This just allows you to chain off a lot easier, which is great. So I do think it's situational though. I don't think it is straight up better than Reckoner's Bargain. There's some decks like I would potentially say like the campfire version of Gardens, which runs like no creatures and basically tries to recycle its deck and kill you with Crypt Rats. That needs life. It needs a lot of life because it's basically going to deck your opponent and then you shuffle your stuff back in with campfire, so the deck, or you're going to kill them with Crypt Rats. Nine times out of 10 is what ends up happening. So that means you need to have a lot of life gain or a lot of access to life gain so that basically you can win that crit rat off because obviously it hits both players. So it's not completely straight up better, but to me in most cases, I would say this is better than bargain. So especially like for affinity, I would say, gives you an artifact. Um, helps with murder. And you know what I mean? It replaces the thing it sacrifices. Obviously something like Crackland Shaman as well can get better off a map token. So if you can get a counter on that Crackland Shaman, it's now a 2-2. You can now sacrifice an artifact and all, every cold author goblin dies constantly. So there's lots of little things and little utility that obviously this card offers that bargain does not. And that is why I think this is number two. Again, very, very close because obviously my mid-rangey bias, I would say, is why this is higher than the Tomb Raider, the goblin. But very, very close anyways. And finally, I don't know if this would surprise anyone, but it might, might not. To me, Tithe and Blade is number one card of this set. So this is effectively a Chainer's Edict, but on an artifact. So in if you're playing Core Skyfisher or Glindhawk decks, you basically have an Edict you can rebuy. So you have an actual removal spell on the Core Skyfisher, which is great. To me, that's insane. Um, also, any deck that's running Deadly Dispute and things like that, your chain is edict can now be sacrificed fodder. You don't get the sac the the flashbacks. So obviously, I'm not saying replace it necessarily, but most likely it will be. This card obviously basically just allows you to have something on the board to sacrifice the Deadly Dispute. Your fanatical offering. Um, yeah, like. It, I can't really explain what exactly I'm trying to say because it is literally just you will edict your have an edict and something sitting there which I know sounds not like a lot but obviously it gives you access to so many different options in Pauper just having something on the board means you can obviously just carry somewhere you can put it on a car, car sky fishing sacrifice it a deadly dispute you can yeah I'm, I'm out of options after that to be honest but they're the main two so what this allows you to do is potentially mardu synth or boris synth splash and black which has existed before you now have a removal spell it ran chainers why not run this um you could also potentially run this in like an affinity build it's an artifact Af affinities kind of had access to chainers and things like that nowadays anyways so what's wrong with running this and then you basically increase your artifact count, which is nothing. Something a sacrifice a Crackland Shaman. Like you can pull it, play this with the trigger on the stack, sacrifice it to Crackland Shaman, kill all the goblins, for example, or do it for two, kill the Swift Spear, kill all the goblins, and then their Dwarven Forge Chanter just sits around, and then it's okay. Now you sacrifice your Chanter. There's definitely things that you can do with this card just because it's an artifact. So, and that's not even getting into the other half of the ability. So what it has, it has craft with creature. So you can pay five, you can exile a creature you control or a creature in your graveyard, which is pretty good. So you don't actually have to have the thing on board. And then it, what it does, it flips, flipping into consuming, sep I'm not even going to, sepulture. Anyways, and what that does is, an, again, another artifact and it just sits there. And it becomes your wincon. You could literally just play four of these and have them flipped. At the beginning of your upkeep, everyone ill gotten gains for four and you lose four. Like, that's pretty good. So, I am really, really excited to play with this card along with all the other black cards. Like, black got a lot of stuff this season. Uh, this season. This cha um, set. So, what this really does is like obviously as i said this along with the fanatical offering along with the draft 
you now have so many cards that gardens or affinity or um any black white base control deck could just run over with like th these are strong cards and this is the strongest card in the set for me the fact that it is just sits there allows core sky fisher to do its thing allows crackland shaman to positively interact with it it allows um obviously deadly dispute decks to go nuts with it i am really hyped for this card i don't know if i want to replace chainers edict in gardens for example with this and i definitely probably will start there but this card is strong definitely so i am uh, i'm excited for this set and that kind of wraps up the video so guys i hope you have enjoyed this top five it is obviously my top five for the lost caves caverns of ixalan names escape me now that they're releasing that many sets but the top five with a couple honorable mentions is overall i'm really excited for this set because it has given black decks a lot of new toys which is obviously they probably didn't need it and it obviously has given the red menace new toys which again i'm excited to see how the decks incorporate that because the the format seems to be fixing itself obviously we have a lot of blue black fair uh we have all sorts of random wild and wacky decks appearing in top eights and yeah let's let's see if it continues to heal and adapt and it gives me a lot more faith in the pfp that obviously they've allowed it to heal and show that it can heal and this is great so i'm really excited to try these new cards out and see what it opens it up so guys Thank you guys for watching this video and please do not forget to like and subscribe and also don't forget to check out Cast and Commons and until next time, see you guys later. Peace.